A couple of uh, easy graphics on the mitral valve. And I want to show you this for a couple of reasons. So look at the one on the right. This is the left atrium chopped off. You're looking down on the mitral valve. It's a simple cartoon. But for the mitral stenosis talk, it's very important because it shows you the commissures. This is the lateral commissure here. This is the medial commissure. And you see how wide that co-optation zone goes and sort of splits all the way out there? Um, mitral stenosis, at least rheumatic mitral stenosis, the fundamental problem is that these commissures become fused. They start to get smaller and smaller and they move to the middle. Um, and on the long axis view, the cords and the leaflets themselves become thickened and somewhat tethered. Um, and this is really important to think about why balloon valvuloplasty works. It works in the mitral space because you have a fused commissure if it's rheumatic. And a balloon, when you inflate a balloon, will preferentially split the fusion. So that's why balloon valvuloplasty works. That's why balloon valvuloplasty does not work in a durable way for degenerative aortic stenosis because it just displaces the calcium that's there, but it doesn't actually affect any kind of splitting of commissures because there is no commercial fusion in uh, senile degenerative aortic stenosis. So often asked, why does it work for the mitral and not for the aortic? Because of the nature of rheumatic stenosis. Commercial fusion is why balloon valvidoplasty works. All right. Um, so I'll show you this because, and that's why I wanted to show you this talk first, because this also applies to the regurg talk in a moment. So look at what the mitral valve has to do. It has to open and get out of the way. Um, the, the anterior leaflet kind of just falls into the ventricle. The posterior leaflet backs up and then in systole it comes in, kind of like an airbag, and comes crashing in. So the valve is really quite asymmetric. Anterior and posterior leaflet are very different. But also look what the anterior leaflet has to do. It has to open in diastole, create this nice vortex at the LV apex, but then the anterior leaflet has to create this bowing because it really is the beginning of the LVOT. Look at that. It creates a baffle so that the flow is effectively forced out in a laminar way out of the LVOT. So anything that perturbs the anterior mitral leaflet, whether it's thickening, replacement with a prosthetic valve, uh, a not particularly thoughtful surgical repair, there's all kinds of ways that even though you have a, a competent valve, you may have a very dysfunctional valve because people often forget the component of the mitral valve and the way it contributes to LV ejection hemodynamics. So it's got to do all these things. So mitral stenosis, um, we've known about it for a very long time, one of the first echo uh, the, um, echo diseases uh, ever recognized. These are the pathologic slides. So normal is the bottom, sort of nice thin cords. I've shown you this is sort of rheumatic corda. They get thickened and fused. And this is the fusion of the commissures up here. This is a 3D echo looking at mitral stenosis. Again, same orientation. We're looking down on the valve in diastole. And you see where the commissures don't go all the way to the annulus. So they're fused. You stick an inway balloon in. Uh, you inflate that to a dangerous place, uh, and then what you do is you affect a splitting of the commissures, and you've dropped the mean gradient from 10 to 5. So a 50% reduction in the mean gradient is considered a procedural success, but that's what it looks like. It doesn't do anything to the cords, the thickening, all of the other problems with the valve. It only splits the commissures. So here's some examples of rheumatic stenosis on echo. And again, you see the way this anterior leaflet, there's a three-chamber view, LV, LA, LVOT. This anterior leaflet has this sort of uh, bowing effect. It just doesn't open fully. And that's because of the chordal tethering and traction at the bottom in addition to the commissural fusion. In the short axis view, it's hard to appreciate this without seeing a normal right beside it, but that is a rheumatic looking sort of whistling. It looks like I was, I was taught many years ago, Charlie Brown should be smiling. Charlie Brown's an old reference. You may not even get that anymore. <laughs> But if it looks like Charlie Brown is whistling with a little hole, that's mitral stenosis. Um, other views, and you really get a sense, when you, when you see a bunch of normals and you see how abnormal this valve is. Now, it's not that thick. It's not, that calci not, that, not very calcified. But the motion is very tethered. And in fact, the stenosis is here, way at the tips. The annulus and everything else is fine. So the effect of stenosis is just at the tips. Other thing to point out, if you look at this last beating view here, the angle of the stenosis is not straight towards the apex, it's in this axis. You see that? See the way if you sort of imagine how that hole is oriented. That's one of the issues with planimetry, and people try to planimetry the valve. Well, they do it from this side. They look straight down and they do a planimetry here, but that's not really the axis of the stenosis. The axis of the stenosis is tilted. So that's one of the reasons why a 3D echo planimetry for valve area, mitral stenosis, has been shown to be very good. The 2D is fraught with challenge, 
often because you just can't get the right angulation of that. So planimetry of the angle, we'll talk about that, uh, is possible. 3D is much better for this particular problem. I'll advance here. There we go. The other one we're seeing more and more of is calcific mitral stenosis. This is the mitral stenosis of the very elderly. Uh, mitral annular calcification, thickly diffuse leaflet. This is not a rheumatic phenomenon. Uh, this is more akin to aortic stenosis. This is a senile degenerative problem. Um, the body doesn't really care. It still is an increase in LA pressure or an increase in pulmonary vein pressure, or, uh, pulmonary edema, and it's all the same symptoms. But it's, a big, it's important to recognize the difference because the therapies are quite different. You can't affect a, a balloon valvuloplasty on calcific senile uh, aortic, or, sorry, mitral stenosis because there's no commercial fusion. So these are the two main types of stenosis. The pressure gradients we mentioned in the last talk. Um, this is how you get them. Again, this is the idea of uh, averaging. So you do a trace of a Doppler profile. And it looks at all of these instantaneous velocities. It derives a, a gradient for all of these velocities and simply averages them. So the mean gradient is one of the main uh, ways to quantitate mitral stenosis. There are some issues, though. So to, to give you the, the basics, mean gradient of 5 to 10. Well, less than 5, less than 3 is normal. Sort of 3 to 6 is mild. Um, people will, will debate those numbers between... 6 and 10 is more moderate, moderate to severe, greater than 10 is severe. So very simply, mean gradient over 10, severe mitral stenosis typically, but you have to also think about other parameters which we'll go through. But in isolation, though, if you looked at only the gradient, that would be the number to know. But high flow rates can lead to high pressures uh, with only a moderate degree of narrowing. So if you have tachycardia, all these things, and we'll go through some examples of why other features, in addition to the mean gradient, are very important to consider. Likewise, low flow rates uh, can lead to low pressures, even for the same degree of stenosis. So flow and gradient are very much wedded together, and you have to be considering both when you use these parameters to evaluate uh, valve uh, stenosis. Obviously, somebody in atrial fibrillation has a lot of beat-to-beat -beat variability. You have to average beats or pick a very representative beat. You can, you could, if you pick a dip one, one beat, you can have critical stenosis. You pick the next beat, you can have no stenosis. So there's beat to beat variability, which really impacts flow, which then impacts your quantitation of mean gradient. So here's an example. This is, this is a continuous wave Doppler. I didn't mention that earlier, but continuous means it's a, a profile where it's going to find the fastest velocity anywhere along this line. It's location insensitive. It doesn't care where. That's a, a continuous wave, where it's a pulse wave. Uh, it's only going to look within a little sample volume that you define. So this is a continuous wave Doppler. You, you measure it like this. This is less than 5 millimeters mercury. Um, the other one we look at, and I'll show you in a second, a pressure half time gives a valve area of 1.2, which is uh, more like moderate. So now we have a discrepancy. One says mild stenosis, one says moderate. How do we reconcile this? What the heck's going on? The clue here is the heart rate. The heart rate's only 49. So if your heart rate's 49, you have a very long diastolic filling period. So even if you have significant stenosis, if you give more time to fill, then you're going to have a lower gradient because you replace that stenosis applied over a long time, same amount of blood, the gradient goes down because you give it more time to empty. Whereas you took this heart and you gave it a heart rate of 90 for the same valve area, your mean gradient would probably be 11. So mean gradient really depends on heart rate because it influences, particularly for the mitral stenosis, all of your diastolic filling period. So this is an example of that uh, heart rate. Again, uh, this is a fast heart rate's 12, a slow heart rate's 4, another heart rate's 9. So this is the kind of Doppler profile you get. So that's why aortic stenosis is so challenging. Also critically important on echo, when you do derive a mitral stenosis mean gradient, the next sentence is, at what heart rate? Mean gradient 6 at heart rate 70. Mean gradient 5 at heart rate 90. That's very important to recognize. Um, this is that planimetry I mentioned. So you're looking at the valve in short axis. That's a tiny little hole. You can do a valve area. Direct planimetry. But more often than not, we know from 3D echo, you're not actually aligned properly. So uh, I personally don't do this in 2D, but it does work in 3D. The pitfalls of planimetry, the imaging angle, the form valve anatomy. Uh, the most important one is wrong tomographic plane. Because the anterior leaflet is longer than the posterior leaflet, the valve isn't really like this, it's like this. So the axis is this way of the flow, it's not here. So um, be careful about a 2D planimetry. 
The other thing we do is pressure halftime. This is the well, I won't take you through the derivation of this, but it's a well uh, derived formula. The valve area is simply 220 divided by the pressure half time. The pressure half time is just the time it takes for the pressure gradient to fall by half. Um, this is well um, sort of validated in its early days against Gorlin. We don't have time to go through all of that. Um, lots of concerns about pressure half time for this, and they're usually the same concerns. One is atrial fibrillation with variable heart rates. The other thing to keep in mind is aortic regurgitation. This is not an uncommon uh, problem. Pressure halftime is saying, if the only way I fill the left ventricle is through the mitral valve, and I, there's a correlation between how long it takes for the pressure to fall across the mitral gradient and how big the hole is. The bigger the hole, the faster the gradient will decay. If the if this hole is small, it takes a long time for the gradient to decay. That measurement assumes mitral is the only way to fill the LV. So if you're also filling the LV from AI, then it all falls apart. So anytime somebody has, you know, really more than trace AI, uh, you really can't rely on the, on the pressure half time because the, the fundamental assumption is broken. Um, and this is just a, an early slide sort of demonstrating that the correlation uh, is much better if you exclude patients with AR than if you include patients with AR. Okay, so this is the other one to recognize. Um, you'll often have mitral velocity profiles that look like all of these. Sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's just this one. And you're, you have to be able to identify an actual slope if you want to use a pressure half time. There has to be a clearly defined slope. And sometimes this is two-phase slope. And I look at this as a ski hill. There's the black diamond here. You ignore that. And you measure the bunny hill. All right? And there it is. That took like an hour. <laughs> okay, so there's, there's Donald Duck who actually bounced down the bunny hill. So remember that. You measure the bunny hill. <laughs> And you ignore everything else. Don't even bother. All right? So, but if you see that clear slope, take it. That's a good pressure half time. All right, so pitfalls. Um, for the sake of time, we'll keep going here. Valve area uh, con by continuity. It's much like I showed you for the aorta case. Um, you look at the stroke volume on one side. So the stroke volume that enters the mitral uh, valve in diastole it has to be the same as the stroke volume that leaves the heart through the LVOT in systole. Um, so the way you do it, oops, I'm sorry, go back. Ah. Yeah, there you go. So basically you take the stroke volume in, you divide it by the LVOT VTI, and you can derive a mitral valve area. We don't go through it all, but the continuity equation is what we do. Um, you'll do it a lot for aortic stenosis. You'll do it a little bit for mitral. Um, but the concept is the same. Stroke volume in equals stroke volume out. Oh, I'm going backwards now. Let's go forward. Okay. Again, all of the same uh, caveats uh, for the continuity. Uh, stroke beat to beat variability complicates it. Other sources of flow like AI and MR complicate continuity. Um, we showed you this. This is the effect of mean gradient based on uh, uh, heart rate and variability it also affects the VTI. So as it affects mean gradient, it also affects VTI, and VTI is the main uh, ingredient in a continuity equation. So uh, all of the same concerns with MS. Um, this is an example here of, of continuity equation pitfalls. So in this particular calculation, we have a, a pressure half time using this slope divided by 220 divided by the pressure half time derived from this slope gives you a valve area of 1.2. Uh, and over here, we end up with a continuity equation um, valve area of only 0.9. Well, what happened here? Which one's right? This one says severe. This one says moderate. So part of the challenge is the heart rate. There's only 49. Um, so this is not uncommon for mitral stenosis, is you have sort of conflicting data. That's why you never use kind of one parameter. You've got to kind of look at it all. And the best case scenario is when it all makes sense. You derive a mean <coughs> gradient a pressure half time to derive valve area, a continuity valve area, and perhaps even a direct planimetry. So that's why we have all, multiple measurements. Um, and then basically you report what you're most confident in putting it all together. Um, so this parent discrepancies, this is an example um, where the gradient is greater than 10, but the valve area is greater than two. Well, that's clearly, uh, that doesn't make sense because this would be, you know, this would be mild or no MS and this would be severe MS. So the options are really there's no true discrepancy, um, and then you've got just a lot of flow. 
So flow can, as I mentioned earlier, can increase your gradient. So if you have MR, and we see this all the time in mitroclip cases, you do a baseline mean gradient, and the mean gradient is six in diastole across the mitral valve. You add a mitroclip, you've actually made the orifice area smaller by putting a mitroclip, yet the mean gradient goes down, goes from six to four. And all you've done is you've taken away regurgitant flow and dropped the mean gradient. So remember, mean gradient is dependent on flow and area, not one or the other. Um, okay, and then there's another example of an apparent gradient. Uh, so this is a case where you have a very small mean gradient, yet also a very small calculated valve area. Well, how can that be? So the options are if there really is no true discrepancy, it's just a very low flow with bradycardia. So lots of time to fill, even though the valve area is small, will give you a small gradient. Uh, or otherwise, you can have inaccurate mitral valve area calculation. So uh, pressure half-time calculation is wrong. Or the other thing we haven't really talked about is the Doppler angle. Not usually an issue with mitral stenosis, but if your Doppler angle is wrong, it's very easy to underestimate peak velocity and gradient. You can't overestimate it by Doppler, but you can underestimate it if you miss the angle. So integration of findings, you do need to recognize symptoms. And this is what I was alluding to. You have to put together the 2D appearances. So what does the apparatus look like? Calcified, commissural fusion, uh, RV dysfunction with pulmonary hypertension makes you think the MS is more significant, as well as the Doppler parameters. Uh, if the gradient, your calculations, and the symptoms really don't mesh, um, it's important to recognize you, this is one of the best indications for a Doppler exercise echo, um, because findings at rest might be mild, findings with exertion could be, be severe. Um, you can do a TE. Um, for various reasons, if you want to directly evaluate the mitral valve or do a valvetoplasty, uh, and you can do cath. If, if it, all of it you know, just doesn't make sense uh, and you have conflicting data, or more commonly if there's concomitant other valve lesions like AI and MR, and then these things get really quite difficult, uh, that's when a cath can be useful, either a, a direct LA pressure measurement with a transeptal puncture or even just a swan. Um, splitability index, the Wilkins score. Um, we do talk about various categories when you're looking at the valve, if it can be split. You look at the mobility, the subvalvular apparatus, the thickening and the calcification. This is the only mnemonic I use in cardiology. Can the mitral split? Calcium, thickening, mobility, and subvalvular. Those are the four categories to consider uh, for this index. You do it twice, you'll memorize it. But it's called the Wilkins score, Wilkins index. Uh, you have to recognize it at some point. Uh, if the total score is greater than 10, uh, it just increased that you may not be successful in the procedure. If the total score is less than 8, you're likely to be successful doing a valvetoplasty. Guidelines, look them up. 2014 was the latest version. Uh, interesting, I replaced this slide, but there's a newer one in 2014. Somehow it wasn't there. Here it is. Okay. This is the 14 guideline. Um, look at it. One major difference is they've called severe MS. They changed it. They upped the valve area from 1.0 to 1.5. No justification for that, um, but they did. So that was a change in 2014.